1948, 1969. An old soldier yields finally to the heart attack he has fought down for years. Dwight David Eisenhower, 34th President of the United States. In the decades since he signed the bill creating NASA, we have launched 19 manned flights into space. This is Radio Moscow. May 16th, two days before our scheduled Apollo 10 flight to lunar orbit, Russia suddenly takes the spotlight. It is announced that the unmanned Russian spacecraft, Venera 5, has completed a four-month, 217-million-mile journey and reached the planet Venus. 217 million miles through deep space. And next day, Moscow announces the completion of a second such journey by Venera 6. Werner von Braun gravely comments. Yeah, I think this is again, again, a very impressive accomplishment, and uh, it just shows again that uh, we can't afford to get complacent. Uh, breathing down our necks and in this planetary field, they are clearly ahead of us. Meanwhile, the three-man crew of Apollo 10, scheduled to take up a lunar module for its first tryout close to the moon, continue their preparations with the busy calm of kids training for a little league game. They've named their spacecraft for characters out of Charles Schultz's beloved comic strip, Peanut. The Lamb for Snoopy, a beagle hound who flies his own plane, and the command module for a lonely but independent little boy called Charlie Brown. Explains Air Force Colonel Tom Stafford, veteran of two Gemini flights and commander of Apollo 10. Since we're going to, to the moon to find out all these facts and try to snoop around, we've decided that the lunar module is going to be called Snoopy. And the goal of command module is Here's Charlie Brown. Slated to take the land down to 10 miles from the moon's surface are Tom and Navy Commander Gene Cerner. The men flew together once before in Gemini 9 and rendezvoused with what became known as the Angry Elegy. Another Gemini veteran, Commander John Young, will hold Charlie Brown in a 70-mile lunar orbit. John, four years ago, shared the first manned Gemini mission with Gus Grissom and the Molly Brown. John's personality is a silent loner. But, in Gene Cernan's words... It's got quite a bit of meaning to us, and, uh, and we go around calling John Charlie Brown now, either in the simulator or out, and he's adapted to that pretty well. Molly Brown's old man. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Stafford reports they are go. We're coming up in the 22nd mark. T-minus 20 seconds and counting. Apollo 10 is planned as a dress rehearsal for the moon landing scheduled on the next one. Doing everything but actually landing men on the moon. Sequence start. Engines on. Five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff. Forty-nine. May 18th, 1969. Before an audience of the chic and famous, our second man moonliner leaves the Earth on a timetable that is figured as closely as the regular daily trains between New York and Washington but is followed far more exactly. Liftoff. Injection into Earth orbit. Translunar injection. Along the way, Tom Stafford calls Earthward to communicator Charlie Duke, himself an astronaut trainee, at Houston Space Center. Man, this is the greatest journey. Charlie, man, that's fantastic, man, really. That's Gene Cernan with Fantastic. Now, with Apollo 10 heading for the moon, and John Young at the controls, the spacecraft separates from the rocket's third stage. Uh, the TV is on. I should be uh, coming down here, and I'll have to adjust it as we come along into the S4B. So starts hey, an astonishing day. live yeah, color yeah, TV yeah, show yeah, from 4,120 miles out in space. It gives the Earth people their first look at a docking while it actually takes place. Next, with Apollo 10 almost 22 hours into the mission, and almost 96,000 miles in space. Houston greets the waking astronauts with a new summary of events on Earth. 
the world has been relatively quiet. In other news I like, Leonard Bernstein left his position as conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. Governor Rockefeller is in Latin America this week on a presidential assignment. A Siamese cat in Vancouver, Washington is mothering three baby skunks who were orphans. In the sports news, the Astros beat the Cubs for the second time in two days. The trails at the Indianapolis Speedway were washed out yesterday. And along the way, the crew radio recordings of the song Fly Me to the Moon and Up, Up and Away. Some hundred thousand miles along, Tom Stafford reports. Hey, we finally got a good view of the moon. We can see the sunlight and also we can see the actually we can see the other part of the moon and the earth shine. Can you back to where we're going, huh? Five seconds. Ignition and Apollo 10 should be burning now. Jack Riley as the voice of Apollo in place of Paul Haney, recently resigned from NASA. The time is 3.43 p.m. Central Daylight Time, May 21st, and Apollo 10 is behind the moon as it goes for insertion into lunar orbit. And it's very quiet in this control room right now. A few conversations going, but not very many. Most controllers sitting at their consoles very quietly. We're six minutes away from the time we should be hearing from Apollo 10. Three minutes, 56 seconds away, we're waiting. 30 seconds. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. Roger, 10. It's good to well, hear from you. I don't believe this thing. That was John Young. The guidance was absolutely fantastic. Charlie, my hands off to the guys in the trench. I love them. But a few hours after Apollo 10 has slipped into a 69-mile orbit around the moon, word comes from John Young of a bit of trouble. Uh, what uh, Gino's doing now is he's up in the tunnel uh, cleaning the mylar out of the uh, out of the valve up there. It develops that early in the linked flight, while Snoopy was being pressurized, the padding on Charlie Brown's hatch was ripped. As a result, would you believe we've been living in what you might call snow for three days, and uh, we found out where the rest of it is? It's in our good friend Snoopy. Then, as Tom and Gene prepare on the 11th turn around the moon to undock Snoopy for the descent, they are unable to depressurize the connecting tunnel between it and Charlie Brown. They solve that problem, but just as the linked craft are about to slip behind the moon, where Snoopy is scheduled to separate, another crisis develops. Houston calls... It looks like we got a constant bias in the, uh, in your, uh, in y'all, in your platform. On our two drift checks, we get a bias of, uh, a torquing angle of minus zero three point in other words four zero, the two crafts instead of being docked in a straight line have twisted to an angle of more than three degrees any further twisting could so damage the 12 latches that link them as to make it hard for them to rejoin later yes it is apparent that the uh, limb has uh interface has uh, slipped around to about six degrees do not undock uh, roger do not undock it means that the main purpose of the Apollo 10 mission, to try out the LEM close to the moon, would have to be abandoned. Then, as they emerge from behind the moon, a message comes from Gene Cernan. We're about uh, 30 or 40 feet away from him, it's station keeping for about five, 10 minutes here. Separation accomplished. John, until now, the silent man of the crew, calls to Tom and Gene from the command module. Keep up the good work, boys. You'll never know how big this thing gets when there ain't nobody in here but one guy. Later, behind the moon, Snoopy fires its descent engine. And then, resuming contact with Houston, Gino calls exultantly to Charlie Duke. We is going, we is down among them, Charlie. Oh, Charlie, we just saw Earth rise, and it's got to be magnificent. There's enough boulders around here to fill up Galveston Bay, too. Down down to 13 miles from the surface of the moon. Snoopy sails toward the Sea of Tranquility to scout one of the possible sites for a future landing. 
And uh, straight up ahead, you can see we're going to go from the highlands over into the Murray area. It's a beautiful sight. Now, having passed over the Sea of Tranquility, Snoopy fires again to swing far out and then back to a point where it is to simulate a liftoff from the moon. The descent stage is about to be dumped, and Gene Cernan is rapidly reporting procedures back to Houston when he exclaims... Okay, ready? Son of a bitch. Okay, let's, let's make this burn on the axe, babe. She didn't, she didn't go, huh? She didn't lock, huh? Something's wrong with that guy. Okay, uh, roll is 180 and pitch is 233. Okay, something went wild there on that staging. And we're all set. We didn't lock it. We're going ahead to the auto maneuver. Got to get this damn thing. Wait till that thing blanks. Snoopy is gyrating wildly. Gene's normal heartbeat of 60 a minute has jumped to 129. But Tom, working the controls, manages to even out the crash. I don't know what the hell that was, babe. That was something we've never seen before. It was real good. I tell you, there was a moment there, Tom. But let's worry about it after we make this burn. I want to make sure the axe is up for it. And I tell you, that was wild, babe. And it wasn't a dab because you weren't axe. That was axe. Oh, I tell you, I thought we were wobbling all over the sky. I'm surprised those residuals. As Tom will later say, this time I had my hand on the staging switch just like we practiced. The other hand on the attitude hand controller. And I was the only one that had charge of the panel for throwing the switches. That was my responsibility area. And so there's no way I could, you know, and also, it, later on, it did it off and on, off and on. And you'd have to sit there with your hand on the switch. So we had a malfunction in the system. I hate to say it's short because we don't know what the trouble is, but there's definitely a malfunction. But it just came on and off for about two seconds. It was a heavy vehicle, and so it just took off, and I stopped it. And again, I had the whole thing stopped in eight seconds. Under control, Snoopy burns his engine and now orbits into the moon. Gene calls. I tell you, we're down here where we can touch the top of some hills, though. Following this second pass, Snoopy swings out to rejoin Charlie Brown, still circling the moon in a 69-mile orbit. Twelve latches snap shut, and Tom calls. Hello, you uh, Snoopy and Charlie Brown are hugging each other. Man, we is back home. Come on. With that, Charlie Brown, having circled the moon 31 times in two and a half days, unleashes Snoopy and heads home. Dr. Thomas Paine, new chief of NASA, declares... Eight years ago, yesterday, the United States made the decision to land men on the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. Today... At this moment, with the Apollo 10 crew safely on board the USS Princeton, we know we can go to the moon. We will go to the moon. July 16th is picked as launch date for Apollo 11, whose crew has long been in training. Meanwhile, from all sides, questions are being asked, doubts raised, warnings uttered. All contain a certain chilling word, contamination. Have we taken enough precaution to keep the Earth and Moon from contaminating each other? Can we be sure that the two astronauts who land on the Moon will not infect it with Earth organisms? Can we be certain they will not bring back to the Earth Moon organisms against which we have no defenses, which could cause epidemics to rampage among all mankind like rockets of death?